So for today's video, boys and girls, I'm going to need Katie's computer, which is in the spare room, but it appears like Navi is asleep in here at the moment. I don't want to wake her. Uh, I should probably check and see if I've got permission. Hey, Dylan. You snooze in? Blink once if I can use the computer. Thank you. Welcome back for another edition of TechForge, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and today we're going to have a look at Undervolting RX Vega 64. Those of you that tuned in a couple of weeks ago, I did some testing on it, sort of pitted it system to system with a 2700K against uh, Hot Fuzz over here, and it sort of didn't perform as well as you would have expected. In stock trim, it was very disappointing, uh, it never reached anywhere near its clock speeds, and the only way to really get it up and about and get that performance happening was by undervolting. The stock cooler with the temperatures that we got didn't leave any real headroom for overclocking so we really were just aiming to get temperatures down so that the boost clocks could uh, match close to what it's rated at. And before we get started I'd like to apologise for the lateness of the upload. I have been a little bit sick the last couple of days. I went and gave myself food poisoning which was a great idea in retrospect. You might be able to tell that uh, in the video itself which I shot a couple of days ago I'm just starting to come down with it so I do look a little worse for wear, worse for wear than I normally do. So I apologise for my appearance and uh, the, the quality that came out of it. So strap in, or don't, I'm not the police, but I uh, hope you enjoy the video. Okay, to do this we're going to be using three programs. One comes with the drivers, it's called Radian Wattman or Global Wattman. We'll find this, actually I'll, I'll show you from here, down in your Radian settings, which is this little red berry looking thing. You just open your Radian settings. Our driver is of course... 18.9.3 freshly updated and in your global settings you'll find global Wattman and you are here this is AMD's own little overclocking tool okay so we've also got uh, tech power up GPU Z here just for the sensors uh, so you can keep a track of what everything's doing mostly we will be where did it go GPU only power draw we'll be paying attention to this little fella right here because we want to see how much power we're drawing uh, we'll also be running Superposition Benchmark, we'll be running 1080p Extreme because it's an absolute monster, absolute monster of a stress test. So what we'll be doing is taking some baseline readings and then going on from there just taking off increments in the voltages to see what sort of effect it has. So let's get started on that without any further ado because it's getting late. We're currently on balanced, as you can see, this is how it ships, everything's greyed out, yada yada yada, let's run it, come on, let's go, let's go, I've already done that, oh man, I need caffeine. Okay, so the GPU's nice, fresh and cold, so this is going to be a really favourable run, it means it's not going to downclock as much because it doesn't have any heat in it already. So let's keep that in mind when we come to the end clocks, as you can see we started quite high, up around the 1460s, which is actually pretty good but we'll see where it ends up towards the end of the run. So we're at the end of the run there and we managed to sit around about the 1430 to the 1450 megahertz mark. So our balance profile saw the GPU hit 74 degrees, fans at 2400 RPM and GPU power draw at 222 watts with a baseline score of 4399 points. I've done some playing around with the fan curve and I've decided that around 2800 RPM is a comfortable place to be with regards to noise and should enable us to go ahead and add the 50% power to the balance tune and see what difference that makes. <laughs> so that was something I haven't seen before. I don't know if you noticed, those textures were bad. Really bad. And I think it's got something to do with Radeon Relive. I've disabled Radeon Relive and now I'm just going to point the camera at the screen, old school. I was trying to get all fancy with the screen recording. It seems like it's not working tonight. Maybe Relive isn't quite as good as Shadow Play. I don't know, it's up in the air. But from now on, we're pointing you at the screen, people. You're gonna ride shotgun with me. Rerunning the 50% power test now with Relive off and things are running just fine. Except for you may notice that with the extra power target, we are thermal throttling as the GPU approaches the 85C threshold. The clocks are going to be going a little bit batty in order to keep the card within spec. We jumped up to 4,685 points at the cost of 85 degree temperatures and a peak power draw of 328 watts on the GPU alone. The gain of almost 100 megahertz did come at the cost of an amazing 116 watts of power. 
As my good mate Dylan would say, that's outrageous. With the cooler unable to cope, we need to bring the temps down now, so let's do the under volty bit. Changing voltage control to manual, you can now edit the voltages of power state 6 and 7. For a safe approach, you would want to lower these initially by 25 to 50 millivolts each and progressing each time you go further and further down, but since I did this a few weeks ago, I know this GPU is fine with it minus 100 millivolts, that's pretty close to where it likes to be. So our settings are now plus 50% to power, minus 100 millivolts, and 2800 RPM fan, let's run that through and see what changes. Now with the lowered voltages, the card is running a lot cooler, back down to the mid-ish 70s, which is allowing the GPU to stay at a fairly consistent clock speed around the 1560 to 1570 MHz mark. This gives us a further bump up in score to 4799 points, which is fantastic, especially since the temp stayed under 80C in a closed case and brought power usage all the way back down to 274 watts. Using the baseline running comparison, that's a 52 watt increase, a 5 degree Celsius increase, and also 400 points increase. For the next run, we'll drop a further 25 millivolts in order to see if the clocks can come up any higher than the 1570 to 1580 range. To give us a little more headroom, I've opted to bump the fan curve up to 2950 RPM, just shy of that 3000 RPM psychological barrier, which shouldn't bother us too much with noise, but might give that little extra heat dissipation on the HBM2 memory. So the clock speeds are a little higher now, but nothing out of the ordinary, sitting around 1570 to 1580 MHz range. The biggest difference I'm seeing are the temps running in at 75 degrees C. Post run, our score hasn't really changed. A few points are well within the run to run variance in this case. Our power usage didn't change much either, pretty much identical at 273 watts peak. Given the same power draw, I would posit that the lower temps were more down to the slightly higher fan curve than the extra minus 25 millivolts. To finish off the test, I wanted to see if minus 150 millivolts will be stable in this test scenario, as well as increase the HBM2 frequency to see if that adds a little more heat into the mix. My testing from a few weeks ago showed the HBM2 would push out to 1060 megahertz in synthetics, but was a little unstable in some games, so I settled on a 1040 megahertz HBM2 clock back then, and I shall apply that for this final run. Now at the end here, and again we see our clocks are around 1570 to 1580 megahertz. HBM2 has been rock solid stable, and our temps are again 75 degrees C, even after multiple passes where everything is nice and heat soaked inside the case. Importantly, our power draw remained at the 275 watt mark, but disappointingly, not much of a score increase with the HBM2 clock. Increase of only 64 points, the difference. I was hoping to break the 4900 points barrier, but alas my dear friends, twas not to be. In the end, we saw some swings and roundabouts with our Vega 64 performance, with the balanced mode sort of coming out as an okay compromise between performance, power, and thermals. It used the least power out of all the runs using uh, 50 watts less than our undervolted run and 100 watts less than our 50% power target plus turbo mode run. And it was generally around about the same temperature as our undervolted run, so realistically out of the box, it's not so bad. I do consider the undervolted scenario the best way to go though. Even though we did increase power consumption by 24% over our balance mode, we increased clock speed by 10%, we increased the HBM2 clock, and we got around about 10.5% increase in our 1080p extreme benchmark scores. The turbo mode with 50% power was by far and away the worst mode to put it in by the length of a straight. <laughs> it was hot, it was loud, it was power hungry, and worst of all, the performance went <coughs> Compared to the turbo 50% mode, our final undervolt saw a 16% power reduction overall of 53 watts. A 10% increase in clock speed to 1580 MHz and an 18.5% increase in benchmark score to 4869 points. Being highly power limited out of the box thanks to the reference cooler being not able to contain a fully unleashed Vega GPU, undervolting these cards is really the only way to get extra performance out of them short of changing the cooling solution. But if you are fine with messing around with things and you need that extra performance, this is definitely the way to go.
So that about wraps it up for this video. I've been Nath with TechForge. If you like the video, drop a thumbs up. If you don't, drop a thumbs down. If you've got any questions or comments or anything you'd like to say about the video or Vega in general as a GPU, please drop it in the comments below. And if you like some videos, then drop a subscribe and make sure you click the little bell icon so that you know when I've gotten off my ass and made a new video. Thanks very much everyone for watching. I'm out of here. I'm Nathan TechForge. See you in the next one.